Mr. Trudeau's government signed an agreement with the Just hold the clock. I know there's a lot of new members in the House. Uh, and we get carried away, but I just want to remind the honourable members when we refer to someone else in the House, we refer to them by their writing or by their title, but not by their proper name. The honourable member for Fredericton. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I do apologize. In 2017, this government signed an agreement with the province of New Brunswick to invest $299.2 million in housing for homeless and housing insecure New Brunswickers, which began on April 1st of this year. Unfortunately, the funding seems to be trickling into the province too slowly to help the people who are desperately in need of affordable and secure housing today. According to a CBC story from last Wednesday, 500 New Brunswickers are currently homeless and 5,000 New Brunswickers households are waiting for an affordable housing unit to become available. I see that the supplementary estimates are increasing funding to the CMHC by $9 million. It is my hope that some of this funding will be spent to help those facing homelessness as we enter the coldest season of the year. Honourable Member for Surrey Centre. Mr. Speaker, this year, Thanks, troops across Canada and around the globe are celebrating the 550th Guru Parv of Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh faith. Guru Nanak Dev Ji walked over 25,000 kilometres across the globe to promote social equality, fight against discrimination, and help the less fortunate. He delivered his message through action and verse, treated everyone as one, and believed in the equality of all. However, since 1947, millions of Sikhs were unable to visit his final home in Kirtarpur, only to stare at it from across the border. But their prayers did not go unanswered. For this year, Pakistan and India agreed to build a corridor from the India side of Punjab to the Pakistan side of Punjab for pilgrims to visit Guru Nanak's final home in Kirtarpur, Pakistan. This corridor has now become a symbol of global cooperation and peace. Mr. Speaker, Canada has the largest, uh, second largest community of Sikhs in the world, and it's truly an honour for me to rise in the House to speak on this very special event. Here, here, Thank here. you. The Honourable Member for North Okanagan, Shuswa. Mr. Speaker, it is truly an honour to be once again entrusted by the voters of the North Okanagan, Shuswa, to be their voice in the 43rd here, here, here. Last week, the Leader of the Opposition stated, and I quote, None of these seats in this chamber belong to any of us, including the Prime Minister's seat. Instead, these seats all belong to the people who sent us here. And they sent us here to get to work. Canadians sent us here to make sure the country works for them." End quote. We all share a duty for a, a, to work for a Canada that works for all Canadians. And I pledge to assist every constituent equally, regardless of partisan orientation. There are so many to thank for this honour, for it is their work and their support that made this possible. Campaign teams, volunteers, staff, donors, friends, family and voters who stand with us as we strive to do our best to serve all Canadians. We take our seats for them. I am truly honoured to be here. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. To commemorate the 86th anniversary of the Holodomor, the famine genocide in Ukraine in 1932-33. 19 people per minute, 1,200 per hour, and 28,000 per day were dying of famine at the height of the Holodomor. The world was silent, and millions died as a result. My grandmother Olena was a survivor of the Holodomor, and she once told me that she hoped that the victims of the Holodomor would not only be remembered, but that they would be honored. Honoring them, she said, meant not just remembering them, but learning the mistakes of the whole Holodomor and taking steps to make sure a crime like this never happens again. Unfortunately, recently, a University of Alberta lecturer, Douglas MacDonald, did just the opposite. He denied the existence of the whole Holodomor, and he called it a lie and a myth. I joined the calls of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, the Ukrainian Canadian Students Union, and thousands of Canadians who called on the university to take significant and meaningful action against this genocide denial. Speaker, let us do as my grandmother would have asked if she were here today. Let us remember the victims. Let us commemorate the victims. Let us honor them. The honorable member for saint saint bagotte Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since this morning, the faculty of veterinary Medicine of the University of Montreal in St. Saint is welcoming until December 12 members of the American Veterinary Association uh, with a view to renewing its certification. This is the only French-speaking veterinary school in North America. 
It has 400 doctorate students in veterinary medicine and is a unique and recognized center for research and uh, a first-class medical place, and it is a source of pride for all, all of Quebec. In 1999, it lost its certification, and it was clear that it was due to a lack of funding compared to other, the three other veterinary schools in Canada. My predecessor of the Bloc Québécois, Yvan Dubier, fought for this veterinary school because Ottawa refused to invest enough funding. But the government of Bernard Landry did give money to the school. After uh, efforts by the Bloc, the money went to the veterinary school in 2012, and it received its certification again. The honorable member for Chateauguay d'Acolle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd first like to thank the constituents of Chateauguay d'Acolle for putting their trust in me again and into my team of uh, volunteers. And I would also like to thank my family. The propane shortages caused by the CN rail strike hit many farmers hard, especially grain producers. The people from my area and the people in all of Quebec were hit especially hard. About 100 or so farmers came to my office on November 22nd during a peaceful march organized by the Montérégie branch of the UPA. I would like to thank the leaders who explained to me the human and economic repercussions of the strike, and I transferred these concerns to the minister. We're happy the, the strike was over quickly and that the supply of propane was back on track. Thank you so much for the UPA for their peaceful demonstration for their minute, and I'm looking forward to continue to working with them. Niagara West. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start by saying how grateful I am to the constituents of Niagara West for putting their trust in me once again. They gave me their support and confidence, and I will work hard every day to make sure their interests are brought here to Parliament. Our beautiful community of Pelham, Lincoln, West Lincoln, Grimsby, Waynefleet, and part of West St. Catharines offers terrific attractions by our warm, welcoming residents. There are, however, common challenges in my riding. First, the odour and light pollution created and produced by cannabis greenhouses, and second, issues presented by cannabis co-ops. I heard my constituents loud and clear prior to and during the campaign. They asked me to take further action on these two issues, and I will continue to do exactly that. I will be exploring all avenues to tackle odor and light pollution created by cannabis greenhouses, as well as ways that we can address the issues of cannabis co-ops. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank again my constituents for sending me to Ottawa to represent them, and I look forward to serving them in this new 43rd Parliament. The Honourable Member for Kings Hans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to congratulate the former member for Kings Hans, the Honourable Scott Bryson, for being named Chancellor of Dalhousie University. Here, here. <laughs> The of Hans West Rural High succeeds the former Deputy Prime Minister, the Honourable Anne McClellan, who was a graduate of Hans North Rural High in the role. Mr. Speaker, I think it is worth noting that Mr. Bryson becomes the third resident of King's Hans to be named Chancellor at Dalhousie after Sir Graham Day of Hansport served in the role during the 1990s. Mr. Speaker, education and innovation plays an important role of shaping a future Canada and ensuring we remain competitive in a global economy. Scott will be an asset for Dalhousie, and I have no doubt that Scott will serve the University, Nova Scotia, and Canada well in the role moving forward. And I would ask all members of this house to join me in wishing him well. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise to say that next year marks the 125th anniversary of the town of Werner. It's important for me to recognize my Franco-Ontarian heritage, and I'd like to pay tribute to every person who's played a key role in Francophone Ontario, including Francophiles. The actions of some parties stand in the way of the development of, and growth of Francophone communities outside of Quebec. I'm proud of my Nickel Belt ancestors, my great Grandparents, Aubin and Serre, immigrated to Field and Sturgeon Falls in 1870. My great-grandparents, Racine and Etier, came to Werner and Cache Bay in 1880. I'm proud of my grandmother, Victoire Aubin Trudel, a descendant of the first Algonquin nation in North Bay, Mattawa. Francophone Ontario is well established and alive. Many thanks to the community leaders and volunteers for their dedication. 
Congratulations. Happy 125th birthday, Werner. For Yellowhead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations on your election. As I rise in this house for the first time, oh, you're here. You're here. I express my gratitude to the constituents of Yellowhead for placing their trust and confidence in me to be their representative in Ottawa. To build unity across this country, we must support each other. I want to remind the Prime Minister that he said we all need to work together. I recommend that we eliminate the use of foreign oil in Canada. The majority of countries we are importing from have low environmental standards and a record of violating human rights. Instead, we should rely solely on Canadian oil to fulfill our energy needs. Also, we need to produce more direct consumer products from all our industries, particularly agricultural and forestry. If you want to build a strong economy, we need to start at home by supporting each other. Time for words is long past. Now is the time for action. Here, here. Here. Well, member for Cape Breton, Ken Sol. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's with great pleasure that I rise for the very first time in this House to address this special place as the Member of Parliament for Cape Breton Council. I would like to first thank the people of Cape Breton Council for putting their trust in me as their voice in Ottawa. I'd also like to, uh, to thank the extremely dedicated group of volunteers that helped me to get here. And of course, I'd like to recognize the long-serving member before me that I know is very familiar to the House, Mr. Roger Kuzner. I know that not only his poetry and sharp wit will be missed, but his collegiality. The past six months have been a truly remarkable experience, getting to so, know so many community members and leaders, knocking on thousands of doors, making thousands and thousands of calls, and I'm inspired by the level of dedication and commitment I witnessed at every level within my riding. And I'm ready to get to work with our Prime Minister and this government to take serious action, serious action on climate change, investing in infrastructure and jobs, and implementing a universal farmer care plan, and advancing reconciliation for Indigenous people, and making life more affordable to Canadians. I'm, I'm ready, and I know everyone here is ready, to move this country forward. Thank you. Honourable Member for Simcoe Gray. I want to say thank you to the people of Simcoe Gray for putting their trust in me as their Member of Parliament. Yeah. It's an amazing honour. I want to thank my wife Colleen, my daughters Lexi and Sarah. Their love and support have been so valuable throughout this whole time. Simcoe Gray is one of the largest and greatest ridings in the country. We are blessed with a diverse economy from Honda Canada manufacturing plant in Alliston to productive farms and orchards throughout. We are a year-round tourist destination from skiing at Blue Mountains, and we have Canada's longest freshwater beach at Wasaga Beach. We are also home to Canadian Forces Base Borden, the largest military training base in Canada. As such, Mr. Speaker, one of my top priorities will be ensuring that current Armed Forces members get the right equipment and that they, and all our veterans, get the treatment that they rightly deserve. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What a tremendous honour it is for me to be standing in my place, making my first remarks Bravo. as the newly elected Member of Parliament for the riding of Niagara Falls. Bravo. Mr. Speaker, I want to first to congratulate you on your recent election. I look forward to working with you and all the Honourable Members of this House as we work to serve the needs and interests of all Canadians across this great country. On the date of my swearing in, I was honoured to have the Clerk of the House conduct my ceremony. His words and advice that day to enjoy the moment and to realise what an honour and privilege and responsibility it is to serve resonate with me still. And so, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the good people of Fort Erie, Niagara Falls and Niagara on the Lake for sending me here to represent them. I stand here today humbled by their decision and for the trust they have placed in me. For a young man who always dreamed this day could one day be possible, I will never forget this moment and the tremendous responsibility they have now placed in me to represent them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. 
housing crisis is one of the most important issues that we face. I've long advocated for access to safe, secure, affordable housing as a basic human right. In 1993, the federal Liberals canceled the National Social Housing Program. That one action caused Canada to lose more than half a million units of social and co-op housing that would otherwise have been built in communities all across the country. Having those units would put Canada's housing affordability in a dramatically different position than where we are today. In East Vancouver, the situation is so severe that we have a tent city at Oppenheimer Park for more than a year. Solving the homelessness crisis is entirely possible. If people can go on the moon, surely we can actually get housing built. During the election, the NDP called for half a million units of affordable housing to be built and for those funds to flow now. I believe the federal government must step up and do their part. We need to work with the city, the province and nonprofits to get the housing built. Together, we can end homelessness. Here, here. L'honorable. The honorable member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, first, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge the constituents of Thérèse de Blainville and thank them for their trust. But I would also and especially like to recognize Émilie Saint-Falaison, who's with us today, who had two different types of cancer in the same year. Two types of cancer, that's too much for anyone. And it seems it's also too much for the employment insurance system. Because, Mr. Speaker, EI sickness benefits are capped at 15 weeks. If treatment goes on longer, well, too bad. And if, as with Emily, cancer strikes twice, well, she'll have to get by without employment insurance, which she paid into her entire adult life. Emily had to remortgage her house, took on debt, and had to count on her family because she could not count on us. When you face adversity, you can give up or you can fight. Emily Saint-Façon chose to fight, as did Marie-Hélène Dubé, who's been fighting cancer for 10 years. We can fix this problem, Mr. Speaker, once and for all. It is up to us. Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, today I stand for the first time as the Member of Parliament for Mission Matsui Fraser Canyon. During the election, I asked voters to consider the following, which bears repeating. Was I open, transparent, and accessible? Did I do my honest part to build positive relationships with Indigenous communities? Did I fight for key sectors of our economy, such as the struggling forestry sector? Did I advocate for needed infrastructure, such as the Mission Sewage Pipeline? Did I fight for a cleaner environment to protect the Fraser River for future generations? Did I fight for a more accountable federal government? And, and, what, and was I there when people really needed my help? To the entire electorate of my riding, hold me to these standards. I stand here to serve you. Thank you for this honour. The Honourable Member for Hull, Elmer. Mr. Speaker, as we begin this 43rd Parliament, where 338 women and men take their place to better represent their Canadians across the country, I would like to make a modest proposal. A to my colleague parliamentaire. I say to all of my parliamentary colleagues, we must, all of us, listen to each other and do a better job of it. Too often in this chamber, we interrupt each other and argue when, in fact, we should actually be taking the time to listen to each other. Being a member of parliament is one of the greatest honors in this country. We've all worked extremely hard to get to this place where legendary people rose before us. Made by our con constituents and respect each other more. Let us listen to each other. It is only by doing so that we will all build a better Canada. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oral questions. Question orale. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister says that the economy is going well, but that's not the case. Last month, 71,000 Canadians lost their jobs. Last month was the greatest number of personal bankruptcies. And 
Nearly half of Canadians are less than $200 away from declaring bankruptcy. Will there be tax breaks for small businesses, reducing at the administrative burden, and a plan to reestablish a, a balanced budget? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there are families who have suffered, who have recently lost employment. That's why we will continue to invest to help those families. We recognize that even if the economy is going well enough to add a million jobs over the last four years, it's not the same situation for everyone. That's why we've chosen to invest in families, to invest in communities, and to cut taxes. That was the first thing we did when we came to power in 2015, and it's the first thing we're doing now. We're going to cut taxes for Canadians who need it. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, the last time this Prime Minister promised to lower taxes, he actually raised them yeah. for the majority of the population. That's right. That's right. The failed economic policies of this Prime Minister have left Canadians with an economy that isn't working for anyone. Businesses are leaving Canada, and foreign direct investment has dropped by 56 per cent under this government. Government spending is out of control, Canada's debt is ballooning, and we are on the edge of a recession. Will the Prime Minister act and provide a fall economic update that includes a plan to balance the budget and so businesses will stay in Canada? Here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Instead of talking down the Canadian economy, on this side of the econ this side of the aisle, we're focused on investing in it. The very first thing we did in 2015, and the member opposite remembers it well, was to lower taxes for the middle class and raise them on the wealthiest 1%. Yes. Today we're doing exactly the same thing. We are lowering taxes uh, for uh, tens of millions of Canadians that will lift tens of thousands of Canadians out of poverty and let hundreds of thousands more know no longer have to pay any income taxes. We know that supporting Canadians, investing in the economy, and lowering taxes for people who need it is the way to continue serving this great country into the future. The member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, it's this Prime Minister who's actively working to constrain Canada's economy, and this approach has left Canada on the brink of a recession. Canada's productivity and competitiveness continues to decline. Wages have barely increased, and the U.S. economy has outgrown Canada's in three of the last four years. Five of the G8 countries have lower unemployment rates than Canada, and we lost 71,000 jobs last month. When will this Prime Minister open his eyes, stop doubling down on failed policies, and just change course? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, the decision we made four years ago and the decision we continue to make is to invest in Canadians who need support, invest in our communities, invest in a brighter future for all. That is exactly what we've been doing. This is what we will continue to do. And the next step of that is the very first thing we're doing today uh, is announcing that we will be lowering taxes, as promised, for tens of millions of Canadians, uh, lifting 40,000 people out of poverty, making sure that hundreds of thousands of Canadians no longer have to pay any income taxes. This is help for Canadians at a time when they need it. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are mindful that this could be the second Christmas that Canadian citizens Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig spend in a Chinese prison. All Canadians stand in solidarity with their family and friends, and we must send a signal that such conduct by the Chinese is unacceptable. What steps will the Prime Minister take to show that diplomatic hostage-taking is unacceptable for a world power. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Our heart goes out to the two Canadians detained uh, in China unjustly. Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver are having, uh, 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 have spent a long time uh, in detention in China. We, we think of their families, we think of their uh, communities, we think of their loved ones, uh, but we also stay focused on them as we have over the past year. Uh, we have continued to engage directly, including myself directly with President Xi, to highlight how much it is important to bring these Canadians home. We will continue to work very very hard, as I know all Canadians will, to send that clear message that those Canadians must be returned home. 
I just want to remind the honourable members, the honourable member for Durham is asking questions and he's trying to hear the answer. I don't want him to be disrupted. So I don't want anybody to shout from either side while the, while the question is being asked or while the answer is coming forward. The honourable member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, 75 years ago this week, thousands of Canadians were fighting to defend Hong Kong in the Battle of Hong Kong during the Second World War. In the last few months, millions of Hong Kongers have taken to the streets to protest the erosion of their rights under the One Country, Two Systems Agreement with mainland China. Canadians value liberty. We have 300,000 Canadian citizens in Hong Kong, and we have spilled blood there as a nation. Will the Prime Minister stand in this House today to show his support for the civil liberties of Hong Kongers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have been very clear over the past months in our support for uh, uh, the people of Hong Kong in their uh, defence of their human rights. We have been long-standing supporters of the one country, two systems principles and the rule of law. We've been calling consistently for a de-escalation of violence and hostilities uh, and ask the authorities to continue to, to engage, to, we ask the authorities to engage in a respectful and non-violent uh, manner with the citizens of Hong Kong, including those 300 Canadians, 300,000 Canadians. Canadians uh, of, with whom we are very concerned. L'honorable député de Belleuil Chambly. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I wish you a very great week. Imagine that I have a cousin called Marcel who works in a factory. The factory closes, Marcel paid into EI and can have up to 50 weeks, could have up to 50 weeks of benefits if he accumulated enough. And among us, we have Emilie. Emilie is ill. She has cancer. And she can have 15 weeks of leave, even though she paid into EI. 26 weeks seems more fair, but what would really be fair is 50 weeks. Will the Prime Minister agree that in this situation there's a serious issue about compassion and equity? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we recognize that there are Canadians who suffer from serious illnesses and they're worried about their ability to get the treatment they need and to ensure that their family is there for them. We recognize how important it is to increase EI benefits in cases of illness. We recognize that there are many families that suffer because of this and we are going to work to increase, as we promised, sick leave benefits for, through EI. The Honourable Member for Belleau et Chambly. Given the time that we have, I'm sure eventually we'll be able to do something, but I don't know if it's going to be enough. I clearly ask the Prime Minister if he agrees to consider 50 weeks in all fairness. We can't prove compassion by talking about 35 million people, but we can prove our compassion by talking about a single person. I invite him to meet this afternoon, Emily, who is here with us and who traveled to Ottawa to meet him. Will he meet her? Before the Prime Minister responds, I would like to remind the members, I know that there are many who are new, that we cannot refer to anybody who is in the gallery. Just a little reminder for everybody. We will continue. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are doing our work in the House of Commons to well represent Canadians whom we wish to serve. We want to serve 35 million Canadians who all have their own challenges. I would be very pleased to meet people that we can better assist. MPs have to learn from their stories and do everything, and I will do everything to meet this person and to help her with the troubles that she is going through now. For Burnaby South. Le plan, le plan fiscal des libéraux. The Liberals' tax plan will not help 47% of people, but we do have a plan that will help them. To help only those who need it most, we can free up $1.6 billion to fund a national dental care program. This would help 4.3 million Canadians and save our healthcare system millions of dollars. 
Will the Prime Minister do what's necessary to help people who need it most? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The class tax cut we're putting, the, putting forward today will not only uh, lift tens of thousands of people out of poverty, it'll allow hundreds of thousands more uh, to not have to pay income taxes at all. We know uh, that by lowering taxes uh, for around 20 million Canadians, we will make an appreciable difference uh, in the lives of many people. Uh, this is the focus that we're taking. Uh, this is a commitment we made to Canadians during the election campaign, and we certainly hope uh, to see uh, uh, support from all sides of the House uh, on this measure. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Fine words can't hide the facts. Prime Minister condemned Stephen Harper's cuts to health care, mais il a continué avec les... But he continued with the same cuts to health and gave $14 billion to the wealthiest businesses. Prices right now. Will the Prime Minister commit today to increasing health care funding to help out people, or is he too busy helping out his corporate friends? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the last mandate, we were pleased uh, to work, uh, work, work out uh, health transfers uh, with the provinces. Uh, we signed agreements with all ten provinces and territories, uh, three territories, to move forward on funding for health care, on things uh, like, uh, like uh, home care, uh, like mental health services and others. Uh, we know there is more to do, which is why we allocated $6 billion in our electoral platform uh, for investments in our health care system including in things like universal farm care, pharmacare. We will continue to work with the provinces and invest. This year, we're spending $40 billion to the provinces on health care transfer. Full opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, families in Western Canada are desperate. Jobs are being lost and people are feeling completely hopeless. The throne speech was a chance for the Prime Minister to show Western Canadians that he understands the struggles they're going through, that he cares and that he was prepared to act. But that didn't happen. Not only is this Prime Minister ignoring the crisis, but he's moving ahead with destructive policies like his No More Pipelines bill. Does the Prime Minister realize that the path that he is on when it comes to addressing the concerns of Western Canadians is taking all of us in this country in the wrong direction? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you, I would like to assure the members opposite and all Canadians that our government takes very seriously the economic challenges that the Canadian prairies are facing. And if I may, I would like to quote Premier Kenny, who said at lunchtime today that he believes a strong Alberta is essential for a strong Canada. <laughs> I would add a strong Manitoba and a strong Saskatchewan. We will achieve that if all of us in this House... ...opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, the crisis that's being ignored is not only in Alberta and Saskatchewan. There's a crisis going on with forestry workers in British Columbia. Mills are shutting down. People are out of work. But no mention of a softwood lumber deal in the speech from the throne. At every turn, and we just saw it, Mr. Speaker, these Liberals are turning a blind eye to half of this country. This is no way to lead this great nation. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister start acting in the interests of all Canadians, not just the the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. In 17, our government has made over $1.49 billion in funding and financing available to the forest sector. We launched our Softwood Lumber Action Plan to support workers and communities, and we introduced funding through the Strategic Innovation Fund specifically for forestry. Building on our work to date, we will be including additional investments to help the sector innovate, diversify, and grow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to say some members have wonderful voices, and it just goes very well. They don't realize how strong their voices are. I'm sure they're just whispering to the person next to them. So I just want to remind them to whisper even lower. L'honorable député de Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker. The throne speech clearly demonstrates that aside from fine words, the Liberals 
have no real measures to meet Quebec's specific requests. Even more surprising, the Bloc Québécois, which got all worked up during the campaign about Quebec's requests, decided to support the Liberals unreservedly about the throne speech. Can the Prime Minister tell us what he plans to do to meet the specific requests of Quebec's government? <laughs> The Right Honourable Leader of the Government in the House. We work very well in culture, infrastructure, or the environment with Quebec. Mr. Speaker, there are 35 MPs from Quebec who have Quebec tattooed on their hearts and who always stand up for Quebec. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, during the election campaign, there was a request for a single tax return for Quebecers, a third link for Quebec's greater city area, and a solution for illegal entry at the border. On Friday, the Minister of Infrastructure let it be understood that there was no third link project in the greater Quebec city area, but $350 million have been set aside for that project. So that Quebecers know what's happening, can the Prime Minister tell me if yes or no, he will support the third link project in the Greater City Quebec area, yes or no? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House. I have the privilege of being in Quebec City last week with the Deputy Prime Minister and we had excellent discussions with the Mayor. We had excellent discussions with Ministers of Quebec's government and we discussed a number of subjects. If you read the press releases after we were there, it reflects the openness of Canada's government to work with the City of Quebec and the Government of Quebec for the well-being of all Quebecers. For York Simcoe. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years, the Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund produced real results for the lake by improving water quality and restoring wildlife. But with more to do, the Liberals cancelled the fund in 2017. After Canada's Conservatives committed to bringing it back, the Liberals finally followed suit. At least they know what a good idea is when they see one. But it looks like just another example of all talk and no action. There was no response from my letter to the Prime Minister and no mention in the throne speech. Will this Liberal government restore the Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. This government has invested significant dollars in water, in cleaning up water in the Great Lakes, in Lake Winnipeg, in, in uh, lakes and rivers across this country. We will continue to move forward to ensure that we are ensuring that water quality is safe and, and is effective on a go-forward basis. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Cypress Hills Grasslands. Mr. Speaker, canola farmers in my riding and across the country have had a difficult year under these Liberals. They're in a desperate position because of lost access to markets in China, a railway strike and the higher cost of drawing their oilseed and grain because of the carbon tax. There are also 3 million acres of canola still buried by snow, yet last week's throne speech made no mention whatsoever of addressing this crisis. Why don't the Liberals have a plan to help these struggling canola farmers? <laughs> The Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Our government always stood shoulder to shoulder with our farmers and ranchers from the very beginning. We have reopened uh, the market in China for beef and pork and we are working very hard to reopen the market for canola. We are also making improvement to the business risk management programs because we know that the risks that our farmers are facing are different regarding climate, regarding commercial disruption as well, and we are working on that. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Speaker, this question is asked during each election in the polls. And the answer is always the same. What is Quebecers' priority? Health. Quebec and all of the provinces have heard the will of their public. Last week, they all demanded an increase in health transfers of 5.2%. Will the government respect Quebec's priorities as well as the province's priority and the priority of the entire population? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, merci, Monsieur, uh, Monsieur President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our health care system is a symbol of pride, and we are making necessary investments for it to remain so. 
This year, more than $40 billion are going to the provinces and territories to maintain our health care system. We continue to work with provinces and territories to ensure that our system meets the needs of people all over the country. The member from Ocam. Mr. Speaker, increasing health care transfers by 5.2% is the absolute minimum to take care of our people in Quebec. That's what the money we need to hire nurses and to hire doctors. That's money to offer better quality of life for our seniors, to offer home care. Will the government listen to Quebecers and increase transfers to 5.2%? The Honourable Minister of Health. I agree with the member opposite that our health care system is a symbol of who we are as Canadians, and we've been making significant investments to keep it strong. This year, for example, we'll provide over $40 billion to the provinces and territories to support the system, over $6 billion more than the Harper Conservatives last year in office. And this is accompanied by our $11 billion investment in mental health and home care services, the largest in Canadian history. We're going to continue to work hard together to make sure that our health care system delivers for all Canadians so they have equal access to quality care close to home. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Joliette, 5.2 percent, we're not going to get an answer. Mr. Speaker, increasing health transfers is one of Quebec's requests. That's why the Bloc sub-amended the throne speech to include it. We're also adding the requirement to collect royalties from web giants. There should not ever be any more breaches in the supply management system and trade agreements either. We want Quebec's environmental and land use planning legislation to be respected. These are all priorities for Quebec. Will the government vote in favor of our sub-amendment to include them in the throne speech, yes or no? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House. Mr. Speaker. We are very sensitive to the requests of Quebec's government, and we work very well with them. We've worked on agriculture, infrastructure, and the environment together, and so on. It's clear, Mr. Speaker, that for the government, the issue of culture, the importance of investing in our cr content creators and artists, that's what we're doing. The government invested more than any other government in Canada into culture. I've mentioned it before to my colleague. We're always ready to discuss and to look at other people's ideas. For Medicine Hat, Cardson Warner. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Huawei and other Chinese telecommunication firms have been deemed a risk by Canadian national security experts. China is known to have hacked Canadian companies and governments and spread disinformation in our own country. Wow. China is not acting like a friend or a partner. Right. We know that Huawei is a real threat to compromise our internet communications. When will the Liberal government finally make the decision mm -hmm. to ban Huawei? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Well, Mr. Speaker, while it's entirely inappropriate to speak of a particular company, but a very thorough invest, uh, examination of, of the associated security and economic considerations in the 5G decision is well underway. We want to make sure that Canadians have access to the most beneficial 5G technology, and at the same time, we will make sure that, they, that Canadians are safe and that their systems will not be compromised. Thank you very much, sir. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins, Lévis. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, it's very relevant to talk about Huawei because our four partners from Five Eyes excluded this Chinese company from development of 5G because they suspect that Huawei is a national security problem and will intrude into personal data. The U.S., Australia, the U.K., they all excluded Huawei. Even the Americans have told us that Huawei could be a problem and could be required to divulge personal data to the Chinese government. What are the Liberals waiting for to exclude Huawei, or would they prefer that Canadians' personal data end up in China? Therefore, public safety. Mr. Speaker, our government takes the security of Canada's telecommunication networks very seriously. And, and Mr. Speaker, since 2013, the Canadian Security Review Program has worked to mitigate the cybersecurity risks that stem, that stem from designated equipment and services, including the companies mentioned. 
We'll continue to work with telecommunications service providers and the vendors through this collaborative program to mitigate the security concerns. We will examine all the security, economic, and global considerations in making this determination. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Honourable Member for Belchester Zeshme Levy asked a question. I was having a hard time hearing the answer. I just want to remind everyone when there is someone answering a question not to shout across the floor. Again, what I said when we first started what if your children are watching? We don't want to bear, be embarrassed by it. The Honourable Member for Gloverdale, Langley City. I would like to thank the voters of Gloverdale, Langley City for the honour of serving them in this House as their Member of Parliament. Now, Mr. Speaker, recently the recently defeated former Minister of Public Safety, Ralph Goodell, had promised a decision on whether to ban Huawei before the recent election. Then he flip-flopped and said it would come immediately after. Well, here we are, Mr. Speaker. Canada's allies have found serious security concerns about Huawei. Will the Liberals do the right thing to protect Canadians from Chinese espionage and immediately ban Huawei from Canada's 5G network? Oh, yeah. The Honourable Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to assure the member opposite and every member of this House that our national security agencies work tirelessly to identify all security threats and to protect Canadian interests. Our government respects the scientific, their, the scientific integrity, but we will continue to listen carefully to the advice of our public security officials as we make this important decision for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, I am a very proud Albertan, uh, and my family has been amongst the proud workers that have helped build our province and our country for generations. Mm -hmm. Now these same workers are struggling, but this government isn't listening. Mr. Speaker, the government needs to commit to working with Albertans to diversify our economy and to help create new jobs. Mr. Speaker, the federal government can help people who have lost their jobs before they lose hope. Mm -hmm. When will Albertans finally get the support they deserve? You're here. The Honourable Minister. Thank my colleague for her important question. Definitely, we've invested massively, more than $500 million in our Western Diversification Agency, but we know that we have to do more, and we know that we have to be there for the workers of Western Canada. It will be a pleasure to be working with my colleague on this file. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. There are workers in Alberta who need new jobs in the new economy, and it's time to act, Mr. Speaker. And uh, speaking of inaction, the Liberals uh, dragged their feet for years and uh, allowed their web giants to not pay their, uh, pay their fair share and to not obey the law. That hurts our artists, our creators, our businesses, and our local and regional media. The Minister of Heritage is getting used to his new environment, but can he assure us today that when he comes back in January, he will have a clear plan to keep that promise and tax the web giants. The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Thank you for the question, Mr. Speaker. I would like to take a few seconds to thank the voters of Laurier St. Marie, who uh, gave me the honour of representing them here, of representing them here in this house. And I'd like to commend you on your election, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to reassure my colleague from uh, Rosemont Cid Patrie. Our position is clear. If you take, if you benefit from, from the system, you have to contribute to it. We will protect our uh, web industry, and uh, we have a pledge to put this law in first in the first year of our mandate. Thank you, the Honourable Member for Vimy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I would like to thank the citizens of Vimy for the honour that they have done me by allowing me to become their Member of Parliament. Mr. Table, the Notice of Ways and Means motion that proposes to lower taxes for the middle class and people working hard to join it by increasing the basic personal amount to 15000 by 2023. Est-ce que la ministre de... Can the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity tell this House what this change means for middle-class families. The Honourable Minister of Middle-Class Prosperity. Question. Mr. Speaker, as our first order of business, we're lowering taxes for the middle class and people working hard to join it. In the members of the Vimy riding and all across the country, I compte de 20... 
as of 2020. This change will put more money in the pockets of Canadians by increasing the amount that they can earn before paying federal income tax. tax. This measure will allow close to 20 million Canadians to save hundreds of dollars a year in taxes once it has been completely rolled out in 2023. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, over the course of the Prime Minister's time in office, Canada's status on the world stage has taken more hits than one could imagine. Whether it's dancing his way through India or suggesting that he admires China's basic dictatorship, the Prime Minister has embarrassed Canada every step of the way. Last week, the Prime Minister was caught mocking the leader of our closest ally and biggest trading partner behind his back like a high school gossip. The Prime Minister is being parodied on network television. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister grow up and start taking his role seriously? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me assure the Honourable Member and all Canadians that thanks very much to the Prime Minister's work, we have an excellent working relationship with our American okay. neighbours. And let me say, in the lives of ordinary Canadians, there is perhaps no issue in our relationship with the United States that matters more than trade. The Prime Minister raised the ratification of the new NAFTA and other trade issues in his meeting last week with the President, and we have been working intensively, including many conversations over the weekend and this morning with our American partners on getting the deal finalized. The Honourable Member for Shikutsumi Rafiao. Mr. Speaker, thank, uh, allow me to take advantage of my first intervention in this House to thank the voters of Shikumuni Le Fia for my re-election. Another international encounter for the Prime Minister, another diplomatic incident. In the meantime, it's our relationship and trade ties that are bear the brunt and our industries that suffer. As long as no softwood lumber agreement has been signed, our forestry industry is vulnerable. When will the Prime Minister how does he think that we can help this uh, for forestry industry that is already hurting? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to reassure my Honourable Colleague and all Canadians that we have an excellent relationship with our neighbours to the south, especially as, concern, as concerns international trade. I would just like to point out to all colleagues here and to all Canadians that today Canada is the country that has the most easy access to the United States market of all countries in the world. That's a great advantage for all Canadians, and we must continue to do this important work. Columbia. Mr. Speaker, the Environment Minister says liquefied natural gas is a long way off from helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions. LNG can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by replacing coal-generated electricity 60 to 90 megatons annually, the equivalent of 10% of Canada's annual greenhouse gas emissions, not to mention all the jobs it's going to create. So why is the Minister looking down on LNG when the minister should be trying to promote it. Good the Honourable Minister of the Environment. President, what my honourable colleague refers to is the discussions under Article 6 that are going on at the Conference of the Parties in Madrid, where I and members of all of the other parties in the House are, are attending uh, for the rest of this week. The focus of the discussions on Article 6 are to set in place a framework to allow us to establish the basis for trades between parties. It is important that those are transparent, that there is no double counting, that there is integrity to the system. We are focused on ensuring that the architecture is in place to enable us to look at an emissions trading system, but the first step is to ensure that it's real. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, liquefied natural gas represents a great opportunity for Canada to be a world leader in clean energy, job creation and the global fight against climate change. However, this environment minister now says we've got to be very careful with LNG. 18,000 British Columbians lost their jobs last month. Right. LNG is an amazing opportunity to help people get back to work. Mr. Speaker, instead of the minister thumbing his nose at new jobs, why won't he stand up and defend LNG? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said before, the first step in this process is to ensure that we have in place rules that are real. Climate change is real. If we are going to allow for emissions trading in, in this world, it needs to be under a system that has integrity, that there is no double counting, that there is transparency in the system. At the end of the day, the focus for all of us coming out of the election should be fighting climate change, ensuring we're doing our part from a domestic perspective to meet the targets to which we committed to our international partners, and that is exactly what this government is going to do. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Mr. Speaker, we were all moved on Friday during the ceremony commemorating the Polytechnique massacre, which was anti-feminist. Thirty years ago, 14 women lost their lives because they were women. And yet, 30 years later, the weapon used against them remains available. It is not even a restricted firearm. The Prime Minister has stated that these weapons have no place in our communities. So will the government step in to ban this weapon that was used to kill 14 women at Polytechnique? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And our, our government has worked tirelessly uh, over the past four years to better, to better keep illegal guns off our streets, passing Bill C-71. But we know that there is much more that needs to be done, and in particular, we have spoken about the presence of military-style assault weapons having no place in Canadian society. They're designed for the battlefield and not for our communities for more than four decades. Police chiefs across the country have been calling for the banning of these weapons, and we heard the most compelling and, and heartfelt testimony from the victims of the terrible crime at Ecole Polytechnique just on Friday. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to listen to Canadians, and we will have more to say about these next steps in the very near future. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Well, stop talking and do your job. Mr. Speaker, we've been talking about this for 30 years. It's time to act, and the government can do so. We on this side support it in its commitment to banning these assault rifles, but we have to ask, add the weapon that was used to kill these women to the list of banned rifles. Does the government commit to banning the Ruger Mini-14 and put in place a buyback program for the people who own one? Before responding to the question, I uh, wasn't. I hope the member wasn't talking to me when he said that you should do your job. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I hope that in the, in, in the coming days, everyone in this House will have an opportunity to do their job and to keep Canadians safe. Mr. Speaker, we are compiling a list of those weapons which, which will meet the definition of military-style assault weapons, and it will be published at the appropriate time. I would simply remind the member opposite that would we release the names of those weapons pr prior to the publication of that order in Council, it would, it would merely precipitate a, a, a surge in, in sales in the market, which is something no one wants to see happen. Honourable Member for Regina Louvain. Mr. Speaker, families... Families across Western Canada are hurting. People in my riding tell me their stories about losing their jobs and are forced to sell their homes. In the last two years, over $100 billion worth of investment has gone from the energy sector and been cancelled. C-69, the normal pipelines bill, is going to make that even worse. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians are out of work because of failed Liberal policies. Many Premiers are united against Bill C-69. When will these Liberals listen? and amend their job-killing legislation. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Certainly all Canadians are worried about the economic issues that are faced by the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. The Impact Assessment Act, which is now in force, was an intended to enable projects to move speedily through the environmental assessment projects so that good projects can be built. It is a far superior piece of legislation to what was put into place in 2012, which has resulted in numerous, numerous project delays. It is important for us that we have a process that will protect the environment, that will enable strong, robust economies across this country, and that's exactly what the Impact Assessment Act does. The Honourable Member, Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after four years of uh, Liberal uh, governance, Canada has never been so divided uh, since this government was in place. And the problem is that uh, the provinces are being pitted against each other. And uh, the Wexit, which was just a rumor uh, just a year ago, is becoming stronger. There are 
the government is doing nothing about this. And worse than that, 200,000 Canadians lost their jobs in the energy se uh, sector. And one way of uh, getting these people's jobs back is to abolish Bill C-69. It was even criticized by the Quebec government. <laughs> The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Impact Assessment Act accomplished a promise that we made to Canadians. It will reestablish the public's trust in the way that, uh, that major project decisions are made. The best rules that we have put in place will reduce uh, delays by half for these projects, increase transparency, protect the environment, and encourage investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, on Friday, the PM said he was open to, quote, making improvements if necessary to his anti-energy, anti-business bill C-69. We assure him it's necessary because more than 200,000 Canadians have already lost their oil and gas jobs. Over $100 billion in major projects are gone, and those losses hurt all sectors in all provinces. But last spring, Liberals rejected 80 percent of amendments to fix the bill. Today, Every single Premier still want major changes. So when will the Liberals finally overhaul their Bill C-69? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Impact Assessment Act has been put in place to ensure that good projects can move ahead, that we can ensure that the environment is protected, and that good projects proceed, and that investments proceed. It is a far superior process to what was put in place when Stephen Harper gutted the environmental assessment process in 2012. It will ensure that good projects proceed. This morning, I had the opportunity to meet with the Minister of Environment from Alberta. We discussed this issue. We have been consistent in saying we are open to how we actually implement that. We will work together with all provinces from coast to coast, all provinces and territories from coast to coast to coast. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Guelph. Mr. Speaker, according to the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, Reaching Home, Canada's homelessness strategy is the single most important change in national homelessness agenda for over 20 years, and we're seeing the positive results across Canada. Although we've made great progress, we know that there's still work to be done. Can the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development please explain to the House how we will achieve our goal of reducing the number of chronically homeless people in Canada by 50 per cent? Honourable Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Yeah, I thank the Honourable Member for his hard work in the fight against homelessness. When any member of our society ends up on the street, we are all diminished. And that is why our redesigned strategy has doubled funding in the fight against homelessness by 2021, and we're making more communities eligible for this important funding. Uh, while there is still work to do, reaching home and Canada's first ever national housing strategy will enable us to not only meet, but hopefully exceed our already ambitious homelessness reduction targets. Merci beaucoup. Bravo. Way to go. Honourable Member for Flamborough, Glenbrook. Mr. Speaker, on November 17th, the Liberals broke faith with our friends in Israel and the Jewish community and took part in the annual Israel bashing at the UN. The Foreign Minister is quoted as saying, everyone knows why Canada voted the way it did on Israel at the UN. Yet the Jewish community and our friends in Israel can't figure it out. They obviously didn't get the memo. Could the minister please explain why he decided to vote against the only democracy yeah, yeah. in the Middle East and our friends? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister for International Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as this is the first time I'm rising in the House this session, I would just like to say thank you to the people of Burlington for re-electing me. I am incredibly proud that Canada is one of Israel's strongest allies at the UN and many other international organizations. We are opposed to efforts that unfairly single out Israel for criticism and seek to isolate it internationally. We agree that there are too many resolutions related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we have called on the international community to channel its efforts towards helping both sides to resume direct negotiations and work towards achieving a lasting peace for both peoples. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, the people of uh, Grassinero's First Nation in my riding of Kenora have been suffering with the effects of mercury contamination for decades. Now, in 2017, this government promised a treatment centre to support the community. 
It is now nearly 2020, Mr. Speaker, and we have still seen no action. Could the Minister of Indigenous Services please tell the House when the government will finally deliver on their promise and deliver support for this community? Thank you. The Minister of Indigenous Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I first want to congratulate the member opposite on his election and, importantly, his advocacy in this matter. I am glad to have had the opportunity to have met with Chief Turtle last week. We had a good, productive conversation. In the meeting, I reiterated my commitment and that of the Prime Minister's to building a mercury treatment facility, and that funding is not an obstacle. We share a will to move forward, and I look forward to working with Chief Turtle and the community to get this facility built, and I'll have an update to the House in short order. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, since I, this is the first time that I'm rising in the House, I would like to thank the constituents of Kelowna Lake Country to have earned their trust. Small business is the backbone of our economy, and it certainly is in my riding of Kelowna Lake Country. And I have personally spoken to thousands of thousands of business owners who have been affected by the Liberals' failed tax policies. Families are paying more in taxes and are struggling to just get by. And in BC alone, my province, 18,000 jobs were lost last month. Businesses are paying more taxes to invest due to the passive investment changes. Will the Liberals' economic update include tax cuts for small business? Here, good question. The Honourable Minister of Finance. I'd like to welcome the member to this House and uh, let her know that in the last Parliament we did reduce taxes on middle class Canadians. We also reduced taxes on small businesses. We were so pleased today to move forward with the next tax break for 20 million Canadians, which we know is important. People are dealing with economic anxieties and we're trying to ensure that they have more money to raise their families to lead their lives. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Veterans Affairs. Many veterans in my riding have said how disappointed they were that the preceding government abolished the Veteran Service Card, a card that helps rec people recognize the service and sacrifice of these brave women and men for our country. See? Our government reintroduced the Veteran Service Card last year. Could the Minister please update the House on the status of the card? Minister for Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the people of Cardigan for electing me for the 10th consecutive time. Yeah. It's a great honour indeed to serve the people of Cardigan. And I want to congratulate my colleague from Orleans for being elected and, for her, and thank her for her question. And I can assure her the Veterans Card is now available for every Canadian Forces member who has been honorably released and is available to anyone who have completed basic training. I encourage all veterans to apply for theirs today so that they continue to link with, link with veterans' communities and be recognized for their valuable service. The Honourable Member for Spina, Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, in my riding and across BC, the forest industry supports over 140,000 jobs. But this year's sawmill shutdowns have created uncertainty for many families. Now thousands more workers will be without work over Christmas, and the federal government is missing in action. At the very least, will the minister commit to coming to BC and meeting with local leaders? Will she work with us to ensure greater flexibility in the EI system so we can bring support and certainty to BC families? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, uh, indeed, I've already had the pleasure of sitting down just last week with the BC Minister of Forestry, and we will continue to work together on programs like the Indigenous Forestry Initiative, which supported 15 Indigenous forest-based economic developments uh, just last year. These investments are supporting diversification and innovation while boosting the long-term competitiveness of the industry. Most importantly, they are creating and maintaining jobs for hard-working Canadians in our forestry sector and the families who rely on those jobs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Um, Monsieur le Président, the Minister... Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities stated on uh, before the, Feder the Canadian Federation of Municipalities that infrastructure should be resilient to climate change. At home in my riding of Fredericton, we have faced the dreadful consequences of some of the worst flooding of the Willistook River, known as the St. John, in recent memory. 
and we've certainly not seen the last of this seasonal flooding. We need to effectively adapt to the effects of the climate crisis. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities is this. How is she planning to use the Green Municipal Fund in New Brunswick to ensure that my constituents will stop suffering from the effects of these now reoccurring and predictable floods? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question. Well, Minister for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the member for her question. It is really important as we build infrastructure for the next 50 to 100 years that we consider the impacts of climate change. We know what the science is. We need resilient infrastructure. We need to be protecting communities. We need to also build in a way that reduces emissions. I look forward to working with the member opposite through the Green Infrastructure Fund. There's also the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund to help support efforts to keep the members, uh, to keep the residents of Fredericton safe. That's all the questions for today. C'est tout pour aujourd'hui. L'honorable député. That's all. The honourable member for Mirabel has a um, point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know I respect your position. I even wore a tie for you. And what I said uh, applied to the government and not to yourself, sir. Thank you very much to the honourable member for Mirabel. I appreciate his apology. I know that in this chamber, at times things get emotional and uh, sometimes you 